Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the July 2023 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook of The Program of the Blancest Fugitives from the Paris Commune by Engels from 1874. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. Also, I apologize if there's more background noise than usual or strange tone to the recording. It's summer and I have an AC on. So this piece was first published in Der Volkstadt, number 73, 26 June 1874, translated by Ernest Untermann for International Socialist Review, volume 9, number 2, August 1908, and transcribed for Marxists Internet Archive, May 2002. Let's begin. After the failure of every revolution, or counter-revolution, a feverish activity develops among the fugitives who have escaped to foreign countries. The parties of different shades form groups, accuse each other of having driven the cart into the mud, charge one another with treason and every conceivable sin. At the same time, they remain in close touch with the home country, organize, conspire, print leaflets and newspapers, swear that the trouble will start afresh within 24 hours, that victory is certain, and distribute the various government offices beforehand on the strength of this anticipation. Of course, Disappointment follows disappointment, and since this is not attributed to the inevitable historical conditions, which they refuse to understand, but rather to accidental mistakes of individuals, the mutual accusations multiply, and the whole business winds up with a grand row. This is the history of all groups of fugitives, from the royalist emigrants of 1792 until the present day. Those fugitives who have any sense and understanding retire from the fruitless squabble as soon as they can do so with propriety and devote themselves to better things. The French emigrants after the Paris Commune did not escape this disagreeable fate. Owing to the European campaign of slander, which attacked everybody without distinction, and being compelled particularly in London, where they had a common center in the General Council of the International Workingmen's Association, for the time being to suppress their internal troubles before the world, they had not been able, during the last two years, to conceal the signs of advancing disintegration. The open fight broke out everywhere. In Switzerland, a part of them joined the Bakunists, mainly under the influence of Milan, who was himself one of the founders of the Secret Alliance. Then the so-called Blancists in London withdrew from the International and formed a group of their own under the title of the Revolutionary Commune. Outside of them, numerous other groups arose later, which continue in a state of ceaseless transformation and modulation, and have not put out anything essential in the way of manifestos. But the Blancists are just making their program known to the world by a proclamation to the, quote, Communeux. These Blancists are not called by this name because they are a group founded by Blanqui. Only a few of the 33 signers of this program have ever personally spoken to Blanqui. They rather wish to express the fact that they intend to be active in his spirit and according to his traditions. Blanqui is essentially a political revolutionist. He is a socialist only through sentiment, through his sympathy with the sufferings of the people, but he has neither a socialist theory nor any definite practical suggestions for social remedies. In his political activity, he was mainly a man of action, believing that a small and well-organized minority who would attempt a political stroke of force at the opportune moment could carry the mass of the people with them by a few successes at the start and thus make a victorious revolution. Of course, he could organize such a group under Louis-Philippe's reign only as a secret society. Then the thing, which generally happens in the case of conspiracies, naturally took place. His men, tired of being held off all the time by the empty promises that the outbreak should begin soon, finally lost all patience, became rebellious, and only the alternative remained of either letting the conspiracy fall to pieces or of breaking loose without any apparent provocation. They made a revolution on May 12, 1839, and were promptly squelched. By the way, this Blancist conspiracy was the only one in which the police could never get a foothold. The blow fell out of a clear sky. From Blanqui's assumption that any revolution may be made by the outbreak of a small revolutionary minority follows of itself the necessity of a dictatorship after the success of the venture. This is, of course, a dictatorship, not of the entire revolutionary class, the proletariat, but of the small minority that has made the revolution, and who are themselves previously organized under the dictatorship of one or several individuals. We see, then, that Blanqui is a revolutionary of the preceding generation, these conceptions of the march of revolutionary events have long become obsolete, at least for the German Workers' Party, and will not find much sympathy in France, 
except among the less mature or the more impatient laborers. We shall also note that they are placed under certain restrictions in the present program. Nevertheless, our London Blancists agree with the principle that revolutions do not make themselves but are made, that they are made by a relatively small minority and after a previously conceived plan, and finally that they may be made at any time, and that soon. It is a matter of course that such principles will deliver a man hopelessly into the hands of all the self-deceptions of a fugitive's life and drive him from one folly into another. He wants above all to play the role of Blanqui, the man of action, but little can be accomplished by mere goodwill. Not everyone has the revolutionary instinct and quick decision of Blanqui. Hamlet may talk ever so much of energy, but he will still remain Hamlet. And if our thirty-three men of action cannot find anything at all to do upon what they call the field of action, then these thirty-three Brutuses come into a more comical than tragic conflict with themselves. The tragic aspect of their situation is by no means increased by the dark men which they assume as though they were so many slayers of tyrants with stilettos in their bosoms, which they are not. What can they do? They prepare the next outbreak by drawing up lists of prescription for the future, in order that the line of men who took part in the commune may be purified. For this reason they are called the pure by the other fugitives. Whether they themselves assume this title, I cannot say. It would fit some of them rather badly. Their meetings are secret, and their resolutions are supposed to be kept secret, although this does not prevent the whole French quarter from ringing with them the next morning. And as always happens to men of action who have nothing to do, they become involved first in a personal, then in a literary quarrel with a foe worthy of themselves, one of the most doubtful of the minor Parisian journalists, a certain Vermeersch, who published during the Commune the Père du Chien, a miserable caricature of the paper published by Hébert in 1793. This noble creature replies to their moral indignation by calling all of them thieves or accomplices of thieves in some leaflet, and smothering them with a flood of Billingsgate that smells of the dung heap. Every word is an excrement, and it's with such opponents that our thirty-three Brutuses wrestle before the public. If anything is evident, it's the fact that the Parisian proletariat, after the exhausting war, after the famine in Paris, and especially after the fearful massacres of May 1871, will require a good deal of time to rest in order to gather new strength, and that every premature attempt at a revolution would bring on merely a new and still more crushing defeat. Our Blancists are of a different opinion. The root of the royalist majority in Versailles forebodes to them, quote, the fall of Versailles, the revenge of the Commune, for we're approaching one of those great historical moments, one of those great crises, in which the people, while seemingly sunk in misery and doomed to death, resume their revolutionary advance with new strength, unquote. In other words, another outbreak will soon come. This hope for an immediate revenge of the commune is not a mere illusion of the fugitives, but a necessary article of faith with men who have their minds set upon being men of action at a time when there is absolutely nothing to be done in the sense which they represent, that of an immediate outbreak. Never mind. Since a start will be made soon, they hold that, quote, the time has come when every fugitive who still has any life in him should declare himself. And so the 33 declare that they are 1. Atheists, 2. Communists, 3. Revolutionaries. Our Blancists have this in common with the Bakunists, that they wish to represent the most advanced, most extreme line. For this reason, they often choose the same means as the Bakunists, although they differ from them in their aims. The point with them, then, is to be more radical in the matter of atheism than all others. Fortunately, it requires no great heroism to be an atheist nowadays. Atheism is practically accepted by the European working men's parties, although in certain countries it may be at times of the same caliber as that of a certain Bakunist, who declared that it was contrary to all socialism to believe in God, but that it was different with the Virgin Mary, in whom every good socialist ought to believe. Of the vast majority of the German socialist working men, it may even be said that mere atheism has been outgrown by them, this purely negative term does not apply to them anymore, for they maintain no longer merely a theoretical, but rather a practical opposition to the belief in God. They are simply done with God. They live and think in the real world, for they are materialists. This will probably be the case in France also. But if it were not, then nothing would be easier than to see to it that the splendid French materialist literature of the preceding century is widely distributed among the laborers that literature in which the French mind has so far accomplished its best in form and content, and which, with due allowance for the condition of the science of their day, still stands infinitely high in content, while its form has never been equaled since. 
But this cannot suit our Blancists. In order to show that they are the most radical, God is abolished by them by decree, as in 1793, quote, May the commune forever free humanity from this ghost of past misery, God, from this cause of its present misery, unquote. The non-existing God a cause. There is no room in the commune for priests. Every religious demonstration, every religious organization must be forbidden. And this demand for a transformation of people into atheists by order of the Star Chamber is signed by two members of the commune, who had opportunity enough to learn in the first place that a multitude of things may be ordered on paper without being carried out, and in the second place that persecutions are still the best means of promoting disliked convictions. So much is certain that the only service which may still be rendered to God today is that of declaring atheism an article of faith to be enforced, and of outdoing even Bismarck's anti-Catholic laws by forbidding religion altogether. The second point of the program is communism. Here we are more at home, for the ship in which we sail here is called The Manifesto of the Communist Party, published in February 1848. Already in the fall of 1872, the five Blancists who withdrew from the International had adopted a socialist program, which was, in all essential points, that of the present German communism. They had justified their withdrawal by the fact that the International refused to play at revolution, making after the manner of these five. Now this Council of 33 adopts this program with its entire materialist conception of history, although its translation into Blancist French leaves a good deal to desire, in parts where the Manifesto has not been almost literally adopted, as it has, for instance, in the following passage, quote, As the last expression of all forms of servitude, the bourgeoisie has lifted the mystic veil from the exploitation of labor, by which it was formerly obscured. Governments, religions, family, laws, institutions of the past and present finally revealed themselves in this society, reduced to the simple antagonism between capitalist and wage workers, as instruments of oppression, by the help of which the bourgeoisie maintains its rule and holds the proletariat down." Unquote. Compare this with the Communist Manifesto, Section 1, quote, In one word, for exploitation, veiled by religious and political illusions, it is substituted naked, shameless, direct, brutal exploitation. The bourgeoisie has stripped of its halo every occupation hitherto honored and looked up to with reverent awe. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the man of science into its paid wage laborers. The bourgeoisie has torn away from the family its sentimental veil and has reduced the family relation to a mere money relation, etc. Unquote. But as soon as we descend from theory to practice, the peculiarity of the 33 manifests itself. Quote, we are communists because we want to reach our goal without stopping at any intermediate stations, at compromises, which merely defer the victory and prolong the slavery. Unquote. The German communists are communists because they clearly see the final goal and work toward it through all intermediate stations and compromises, which are created not by them but by historical development. And their goal is the abolition of classes, the inauguration of a society in which no private property in land and means of production shall exist any longer. The 33, on the other hand, are communists because they imagine that they can skip intermediate stations and compromises at their sweet will. And if only the trouble begins, as it will soon, according to them, and they get hold of affairs, then communism will be introduced the day after tomorrow. If this is not immediately possible, then they are not communists. What a simple-hearted childishness, which quotes impatience as a convincing argument in support of a theory. Finally, the 33 are revolutionaries. In this line, so far as big words are concerned, we know that the Bakunists have reached the limit, but the Blancists feel that it is their duty to excel them in this, and how do they do this? It is well known that the entire socialist proletariat, from Lisbon to New York and Budapest to Belgrade, has assumed the responsibility for the actions of the Paris Commune without hesitation. But that's not enough for the Blancists. Quote, As for us, we claim our part of the responsibility for the executions of the enemies of the people by the Commune, whose names are then enumerated. Quote, we claim our part of the responsibility for those fires which destroyed the instruments of royal or bourgeois oppression or protected our fighters. Unquote. In every revolution, some follies are inevitably committed, just as they are at any other time. And when quiet is finally restored and calm reasoning comes, people necessarily conclude we have done many things which had better been left undone, and we have neglected many things which we should have done, and for this reason things went wrong. But what a lack of judgment it requires to declare the commune sacred, to proclaim it infallible, to claim that every burnt house, every executed hostage, 
received their just dues to the dot over the eye. Is that not equivalent to saying that during that week in May, the people shot just as many opponents as was necessary, and no more, and burnt just those buildings which had to be burnt, and no more? Does not that repeat the saying about the first French Revolution? Every beheaded victim received justice, first those beheaded by order of Robespierre, and then Robespierre himself. Two such follies are people driven, when they give free rein to the desire to appear formidable, although they are at bottom quite good-natured. Enough. In spite of all follies of the fugitives, and in spite of all comical efforts to appear terrible, this program shows some progress. It's the first manifesto in which French workingmen endorse the present German communism. And these are, moreover, working men of that caliber who consider the French as the chosen people of the revolution and Paris as the revolutionary Jerusalem. To have carried them to this point is the undeniable merit of Vaillant, who is one of the signers of the manifesto and who is well known to be thoroughly familiar with the German language and the German socialist literature. The German socialist working men, on the other hand, who proved in 1870 that they were completely free from jingoism, may regard it as a good sign that French working men adopt correct theoretical principles, even when they come from Germany. And that's the end of the audiobook. So, some people missed the comments. I feel like this was pretty much self-explanatory, but I'll do some comments. How's that? Okay, so a few years after the Paris Commune, which was hailed as the first proletarian revolution, or sustained uprising at least, you have those rebels who helped to lead these efforts, which was defeated, and then they're still alive and they have to figure out what are they going to do, because if they stick around, obviously when, quote, order is restored, they're going to be targeted by the law. So while in hiding, this group published a manifesto, basically saying that the commune is going to you know, there's going to be a new upsurge almost immediately, and they're going to lead it. And Engels is criticizing basically their entire motive for doing this, as well as some of the specifics that they said. So one of his major criticisms is that these people are professional revolutionaries, not in the sense of waging a sustained campaign, but self-styled men of action who just have to constantly be, you know, engaged where the action is at. And if there's no action happening due to historical circumstances, then... What are they going to do? They're going to do foolish, ridiculous things like publishing this particular manifesto, which Engels found riddled with flaws. Now, on the one hand, you have some sympathy for these people because the Paris Commune was, to a certain extent, the most successful action of its kind up to that point in history. And I'm sure that if I had been involved, you know, deeply in the leadership of that, the temptation would be strong to just want it to keep going and no, this is just a setback. We're about to have another revolutionary flare up. It's right around the corner any time now soon. But as Engels is saying, this is basically, in this case, a flaw in their thinking that you can basically just have revolution on command, not because the masses have decided that it's their collective will and the collective mood of the people to abolish the present state of affairs, but that you can just get a small group of adventurists together start doing some conspiracies, some terrorism, whatever it is, some types of actions, and that this is basically going to be the spark that lights the fire. But history is full of surprises. It's much stranger than that, and it doesn't really work that way, though, again, it may be tempting to believe that it is. You can never really predict what the spark is going to be, you know, the straw that finally breaks the camel's back. Is it straw number 5071? Well, that camel's looking pretty strained, but maybe it's going to be 5072. And what was the difference between the two? Who knows? It depends on a million different variables. All we know is that the camel finally said, I can't do this anymore. Okay, so the group became known as Blancists, and Engels goes through an extensive section talking about Blanqui, who was Blanqui, sort of a master conspiracist who believed that, you know, you could just get small teams of adventurers, conspirators together, do some kind of action, and that was going to kick off a revolution. But Engels referred to this as the thinking of a, quote, revolutionary of the preceding generation, which he considers long obsolete. Basically, these flawed principles are not embraced by Marxism, which looks at historical conditions above all. And in Engels' opinion, it was very clear that the Parisian proletariat basically needed a long time to gather up its strength. It wasn't ready to launch another offensive against the bourgeoisie and the status quo. 
And, you know, that could have been the case, except in Engel's estimation, it wasn't here. So, you know, that was unlikely to happen, no matter how many provocations or examples were set by this group of conspirators. Okay, so then he talks about the three points that they declare about themselves, that they are atheists, communists, and revolutionaries. Okay, fine. I mean, Marx and Engels were those things, too. Nothing wrong with that in and of itself. In fact, that's what you would expect from communists. But... Engels accuses them of doing it very badly, basically in the style of edgelords. I like the way that he said this, actually. He said that such follies, making these ridiculous proclamations, and again, not that the ideas themselves of atheism, communism, and revolution are ridiculous, but the way that they went about it, are follies that people are driven to when they give free rein to the desire to appear formidable, although they're at bottom quite good-natured. So you basically have basically nice guys trying to look scary and just not having any idea. It's not genuine, it's not sincere, and it's coming off as cringy. But in sum, Engels says that in spite of all follies of the fugitives and in spite of all comical efforts to appear terrible, this program shows some progress. It's the first manifesto in which French workingmen endorsed the present German communism, which Engels held in higher regard. And he also credits that, you know, in any situation, including revolutionary situations, people are bound to have some ridiculous things. There will be excesses where there should have been restraint, and there will be restraint where there should have been additional action. There's nothing necessarily to be ashamed about that, although, of course, in any situation you want to keep your folly to a minimum. But he says that their main error here is not even in recognizing that, just being like, everything we did was completely right and justified. Well, that's just a lack of wisdom there. A lack of humility, a lack of introspection, and basically just driven by this extreme impatience to just get back to it. Well, no, the masses were not ready for that. This was the time to, you know, analyze what went wrong, what went right, and to prepare the next offensive, but which might not be ready for some time. Of course, we want oppression and exploitation to be ended as soon as possible, but as soon as possible, has a meaning. The masses make history, and yeah, it can be annoying, I guess, to wait around for the masses, which sometimes show a seemingly inexplicable patience and tolerance for this oppression and exploitation. But look further, there are other causes, and a successful materialist can dig into those and address those instead of just idealistically shouting at people to do things which they are just simply not ready to do. If you don't like what people are doing, there are ways to try to change that, but that's not necessarily the way. you got to get at the underlying reasons as to why they're doing it in the first place. This is not to excuse what they're doing. This isn't to justify it. This isn't to validate it. Because it is ultimately harmful and destructive and just not a healthy way of addressing the problems that they're facing. But the fact is, if they had the ability, the skills, whatever it is, the perspective to deal with the situation at hand, they'd be more likely to do that. Okay, last point. I want to mention that there is a certain line of criticism of Lenin in particular, that he was a Blancist, even though this runs counter to pretty much everything in Marxism, even though Lenin himself wrote against Blancism and showed a clear understanding of what it was and why you shouldn't follow it. You see this particularly with anarchists, people who are against the idea that there is a vanguard within the working class, people who have more class consciousness than others. Now, I would say that that's just a simple fact because not everybody is at the same level of class consciousness. Some are more and some are less class conscious. That's just the typical variety you're going to find in any situation. And of course, Lenin did hold that the vanguard needed to be organized in a vanguard party. But that party alone wasn't going to make the whole revolution. It was just a necessary part of it. Anarchists in particular like to say that the idea of a vanguard party is inimical to even Marx and what Marx said because this vanguard party then somehow denies agency to the rest of the working class. But that's just simply not the way that it works. It's not the way that it worked in the Russian Revolution. What you actually had in the Russian Revolution were radlibs and populists and other supposed, you know, friends of the working class who were constantly trying to side with and give power to the big bourgeois party, the cadets, and the Bolsheviks actually resisting this and fighting it at every turn in order to preserve the revolution, not destroy it. 
We may pick up this topic again later, but I first heard this in a video by Anarch, an anarchist YouTuber, as the name implies, called The State is Counter-Revolutionary, which is a very long thing. It was one of the first things somebody asked me to do a response video to. It was way too long, and I found it was the sloppiest collection of, you know, just slapdash assembly of anti-Leninist talking points. Really just a flood of them to the point where you couldn't really go into detail of why so much of it was just ludicrous without doing tons of background. So if you started with their three-hour video or whatever, you'd wind up doing a nine-hour video. By the time you actually explained why the whole thing was, you know, just extraordinarily flimsy or just based on lies. But I did want to mention that. Okay, thanks to the patrons whose names are on the screen.